Sometimes it takes a lot of energy to change the temperature of a sample, and sometimes it doesn't take any, it seems like. So specific heat is the way that we can quantify the amount of heat required to change one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius. This specific heat changes for different substances, okay? So for instance, if you think about all the different thermal, thermal um, climates that are out there, so if you think about an island, Hawaii, I don't know if anybody's ever been there, I'd love to go myself, okay? But if you think about Hawaii, for instance, they say it's between 70 and 80 degrees year round, okay? Why is that? It's an island, it's surrounded by water. Water has very high specific heat. That means it takes a lot of energy to change one gram of that water by one degrees. And the same way is the reverse. It takes a lot of energy to decrease one degree Celsius, okay? So that water that's around the island kind of serves as an insulator for high, quick temperature fluxes. Okay? Because if it takes a lot of energy to change that temperature, the water is going to absorb all that extra energy that's added from the sun. Then whenever it's cooled off at night and there's not all this heat being released by the sun, guess what? The water is going to release the heat. And it's going to keep that temperature nice and moderate year-round. Okay? So in a way, I like this last temperature, this last definition. Specific heat is a kind of thermal inertia that must be overcome to change temperature. So if you have a high specific heat, you have a high inertia. Inertia is resistance to change. So if you have a high specific heat, it's going to take a lot of energy to get you to change. Okay? Kind of think about it how some people are really easygoing. They like to be changed. They're open to options and possibilities, whereas other people have a lot of thermal inertia. It takes a lot of energy to get them to make a change in their life. Okay? Molecules are the same way. Some substances are easygoing. Some have a really high thermal inertia. Okay? And this thermal inertia, what it actually comes from is the types of forces that are present between molecules. So when we thought about water earlier and the hydrogen bonds, that's what leads it to having a high specific heat. Okay? So let's look at a table. Um, sorry, before we look at the table, we'll look at iron versus water. Okay? So water, it takes, if you come all the way over here, 4.1 in order to change one degree of Celsius. Okay, one gram, one degree Celsius. Whereas iron, if you have one gram of it, it only takes 0.451 joules. So water is going to require a lot more energy before it'll make that change. It has a lot larger amount of that inertia we talked about. Okay, now here's that table I referred to. Here we've got liquid water, 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. If you kind of look around here and look at the rest of them, okay, we've got ice. That's interesting. I thought we already had H2O. Huh, there's H2O again. Water vapor. How strange. Why in the world do you think that is? Whereas you've got metals down below and they have a much lower specific heat. Hmm. Okay. Let's propose that question. Oops, I guess I have that on a later slide. Okay. So let's think about this a little bit. Liquid water versus ice versus water vapor. All right, well, what did we learn about before? That very first slide. How do those vary? How are they different? Okay. With ice, you have a solid. With water vapor, you have the gas phase. So in the gas phase, for instance, let's look at that one first. The molecules, do they have a lot of energy? Hardly any energy. A lot of energy. And how are they spaced apart? They're really far spaced apart. Okay. Whereas in ice, they're really close together, very rigid. Okay. That's kind of the reason why liquid water is so high compared to water vapor. And water vapors, they're not able to form hydrogen bonds. Why not? They have too much energy, they're moving around too fast. Okay. So they don't have sufficient time to form a strong bond between molecules. Okay. Whereas with ice, you don't quite have the same order. So a lot of these hydrogen bonds that you have in liquid water are not the same as when they're in ice. And so you don't have that beautiful structure that's formed in liquid water to overcome. Okay? So in ice, there just are not the same forces holding it together. 
Okay, so with liquid water, you have a very high specific heat you have to overcome, but as ice and water vapors are much lower. And then all the metals, notice all them, they have a much lower specific heat, okay? That's why if you drop a hot piece of aluminum, say, into water, you hear that nice sizzle, sizzle, sizzle. It's quickly trying to get rid of its heat, but water is only slowly taking all that energy in and spreading it out throughout its sample, okay? At the bottom of the screen, we see an equation. Q equals CM delta T. Sometimes I do MC delta T, like M cat. So if that helps you remember it, great. So Q equals MC delta T or Q equals MC delta T. Either one is perfectly acceptable. Heat and its units are joules. Specific heat, if we come up here to the top of the slide, the units for that are joules per gram degrees Celsius. Mass, we need our grams to cancel, so guess what? Its mass should be in grams. And then temperature, for gas laws, we don't want Celsius to ever be used, okay? But for this one, because we have Celsius as our unit for specific heat, we want our unit to be in degrees Celsius. Okay. Delta T, MC, delta T, if that's the way you want to think about it. This delta T, what does delta T mean, literally? Okay. Anytime you see the delta sign, it means final minus initial. So delta T is the same thing as saying temperature final minus temperature initial. Okay, and that's the change in temperature. Okay, so let's do some examples. All right. So the question is, how much heat would 0.57 grams of water absorb when it is heated from 32 degrees Celsius to 50.1 degrees Celsius? All right. So the first thing you want to do is you want to lay down and figure out all of the different variables. All right. So to begin with, let's just underline our numbers. 0.57 grams heat from 32 degrees Celsius to 50.1 degrees Celsius. Okay? Grams, what is that a unit of? Mass. 32 degrees Celsius, that is a temperature. And 50.1 degrees, that is also a temperature. Okay? So we can write it right here. Mass equals 0 0.57 grams. Temperature? And is that our initial temperature of 30 degrees? Yes, because it's heated from 32 to 50 degrees. So that's the same thing as saying your temperature initial equals 32.0 degrees Celsius. And that means your temperature final equals 50.1 degrees Celsius. Okay. The question also asks us how much heat. Do you remember what our symbol was for heat on the previous page? That's right, Q. Okay. So our Q is what we are solving for because it says how much. Okay, what are we missing? We're missing specific heat, okay? And notice I didn't say it was liquid water, okay? So it could have been in this slide, it could have been ice, it could have been water vapor. So how do I know to use 4.184 and not any of the other two numbers? Well, for one, what's the temperature? The temperature that we're looking at is 32 to 50 degrees. If you have water at 32 degrees, what phase is it in? Liquid. Okay, so you have to look at the temperature to tell you what phase you're in. If I had done this from negative 20 to negative 15, you would know you had to use the specific heat for ice. Okay, if I had said heated from 110 to 187, then you would know you'd have to use the specific heat for water vapor, okay, because that's the vapor phase that it's in. Okay, so. Our other variable to identify is C, which is 4.184 joules per gram degrees Celsius. Okay. And we're going to use Q equals MC delta T to solve. So Q equals 0 0.57 grams times our C, which is 4.184 joules per gram degrees Celsius times T final, 50.1 degrees Celsius minus T initial, 32.0 degrees Celsius. Okay? All 
All right. So the first thing I want us to do is just Q equals, we're going to rewrite the first part of this. 5, 7 grams times 4.184 joules per gram degrees Celsius. And then we're going to type into our calculator 50.1 minus 32.0. Okay. And we are getting 18.1 degrees Celsius. You can also do this in two steps. Just make sure that you include your parentheses in your calculator. I mean, you can do it in one step. Okay, now let's look at our units and see what's going to cancel. We have gram on top here, gram on bottom here, Celsius on top here, Celsius on bottom here, so we're left with joules, which is that our unit for Q? Yes, so we are good on that. Okay, now finish out the problem. 0.57 times 4.184 times 18.1, and we're going to get Q equals 43. 0.166 joules. Okay. We have to check sig figs. If we go back and we look at our sig figs, for our mass, how many sig figs do we have? Two. Temperature initial, we have three. Temperature final, we have three. And then C, our specific heat, do we care about sig figs from that? No, because it came from a table, so we do not care about sig figs from our table their values. Okay. So that means we have to only have two sig figs, because our mass has two sig figs. So Q equals 43 joules. And that is our final answer. Okay? Good. All right, so that's the first type of specific heat problem, okay, where we're given a mass, a specific heat, and a temperature change. What if we were to look at the inverse problem, okay? where we have a 1.60 gram sample of a pure substance <coughs> excuse me, is heated from 17 degrees Celsius to 86.8 degrees Celsius by the addition of 270.3 joules of heat. What is the substance? Okay, let's start out the same way we started out last time. Identify all of our variables. Okay, 1.60 grams, that's our mass heated from 17 degrees, that's our temperature initial, to 86.8 degrees, temperature final, with the addition of 270.3 joules, so that is our heat. Okay, so mass equals 1.60 grams, temperature initial equals 17.0 degrees Celsius, temperature final equals 86.8 degrees Celsius, Heat equals 270.3 joules. Okay, so then the question just says, what is the substance? Well, if we look at our equation, no part of that equation says, oh, here's your substance. So how can we figure out the answer to this problem? What are we missing? We have M, we have W, we have Q. Do we know the specific heat? No. But if we figure out the specific heat, we can then match that specific heat to our previous table and identify what our substance is. So we are solving for specific heat. So Q equals MC delta T, which means C equals Q over M delta T. Okay. So C equals 270.3 joules over our mass, which is 1.60 grams, times our delta T, which is 86.8 degrees Celsius minus 17.0 degrees Celsius. All right, so let's do this in a, two steps once again. 270.3 joules, and I'm just doing this so that way we can more readily figure out what our units are for C. Okay, so divide 270.3, divided by 1.60 grams, and then we've got 86.8 minus 17 gives us 69.8 degrees Celsius. Okay, so what are our units? Does anything cancel? 
No. So we've got joules divided by grams divided by green degrees Celsius. So that is our units. So 270.3 divided by divided by 69.8 equals C equals. And let's look at our sig figs before we write down the answer. Three in mass, three in temperature initial, three in temperature final, and four in Q. Okay. So that means we've got a total of three sig figs to report. 2.42 joules per gram degrees Celsius. All right, we're done, right? We answered the question. Wait, we didn't. The question said, what is the substance? It didn't say, what is the specific heat? So if our specific heat is 2.42 joules per gram degrees Celsius, we can come to our next slide and go 2.42 joules per gram Celsius. So that means our sample is ethylene glycol or antifreeze. Okay. So if you notice, if we go back to that slide, that's kind of interesting. If we're to heat our, our car from 17 to 86 degrees and we have 1.6 grams of antifreeze, we need to add 270.3 joules of heat. So notice with it being decently high, higher at least than a lot of the metals that are in our car, that antifreeze can help take a lot of the heat that is produced by your engine. So that's one of the benefits of it. Okay? And so that's one of the ways that they think about the different properties that go into different cooling agents in your car. Okay? And it also helps prevent it from freezing. The same process, same idea. Okay? So this is the slide I mentioned earlier about why is a specific heat water different than ice and vapor. Again, just kind of to review it, as table 8.1 shows, the specific heats of ice and water vapor are about half that of liquid water. Only liquid water has a remarkable specific heat, okay? By remarkable, we mean so high. This is because the liquid phase is the only phase in which hydrogen bonds are continually breaking and reforming. With your solid phase, they're not constantly breaking, okay? They're just solid, okay? So specific heat describes the substance's resistance to temperature change. So it's kind of that energy inertia that we talked about, which is governed by the equation Q equals MC, Delta T.